Good morning, everybody. Well, we have some really good news this morning. Last night, the state legislature made history and acted to right a wrong and legalize marijuana the right way. And I really want to emphasize this. I want to thank the state legislature. I want to thank the leadership for being so conscientious now over several years, really studying the issue carefully, focusing on the right way to do things with a particular eye to addressing the mistakes of the past. And really profound thanks to Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, to Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie, to the Chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Liz Kruger, to the Majority Leader of the Assembly, Crystal Peoples-Stokes. Uh, Senator Kruger, Assembly Member Sto Peoples-Stokes were the uh, co-sponsors of the legislation. I talked to them multiple times. They put an immense amount of effort into this with a focus on equity. Uh, the issues that we raised now almost three years ago, uh, the city of New York put out a report delineating the kinds of things that would be necessary to do legalization the right way. And that included making sure that the economic opportunities that would come would focus on the communities that were most harmed by the previous drug laws, that there would be actually an economic benefit to folks who had suffered the most. This legislation goes a long way to achieving that. Also, a focus on ensuring that the mistakes of the past, uh, the convictions that held back so many people for very small offenses, that those would be expunged. And uh, a focus on investment in communities that have suffered and ensuring that this is part of their economic uh, rebirth. Uh, a lot of good in this legislation. And a lot more to be done, by definition. And that's something we will be working closely with the state on uh, in this year, next year, the years ahead to get it right. Still want to make sure that the voices of localities are heard and respected in this process. But this is a hugely important moment for the state of New York. So a huge congratulations to the legislature for a, a major, major step to reform. And uh, continuing the good news trend this morning, I want to talk to you about the latest vaccination update. And I've said that uh, when we talk about a recovery for all of us, the number one element of the recovery is to ensure the maximum number of vaccinations as quickly as possible. So today, good news, we have passed the 4 million vaccination mark. Over 4 million vaccinations have been given in New York City since this effort began. The exact number, 4,058,854 doses have been given. And... I've always tried to give you some context of how that compares to the total population of major American cities. When we started doing this uh, toward the end of January, we talked about surpassing the total population of Boston. Then we talked about other cities along the way, Phoenix, Houston, Chicago, some of the biggest cities in the country. Well, here's the comparison now. We have now surpassed 4 million vaccinations. That's more vaccinations than the total population of Los Angeles, California, to give you a sheer sense of the extent here. Because we're New Yorkers, sometimes we hear big numbers and it kind of goes right by us because we're so used to doing everything big around here. Think about that though, as many doses given as the total population of LA and we're gonna be going farther going forward. We'll start comparing to state populations since we've run out of other cities to compare. Now, the good news is we continue to expand our capacity. More and more sites coming online, more and more grassroots sites, more staff, everything's clicking, we need the supply. So I'm gonna keep hammering away on this point. We need the supply, we need the flexibility so we can reach our goal and we will reach our goal. Five million fully vaccinated New Yorkers by June. So this is the way forward. So recovery for all of us, the foundation is vaccination. The foundation is bringing back the city strong and healthy. But recovery for all of us, it goes far beyond just the question of bringing back our economy. It goes to bringing back this city strong in every way, and in fact, doing things differently, addressing the mistakes of the past, rejecting a status quo that didn't work, doing something that really is befitting of the greatest city in the world. And one of the areas that we continue to work on is improving the relationship between police and community, deepening reforms in NYPD. This is work that will continue to go on. We just had an extraordinary process uh, that created a huge reform plan with a lot of big steps forward. But we are said, I said, I know members of the council said, we've all said, 
the work always continues. So today, the work will continue because it's so important to recognize there's always more to be done. In the reform package, we addressed a host of issues. We addressed, for example, uh, a better process for assessing officers who might have problematic behavior and ensuring that they are addressed and, if necessary, that they do not patrol our streets. We address things like ensuring that if someone has, an officer has committed a serious act of misconduct and it has uh, been proven through due process, calling upon the state to cancel pensions in that case. Uh, we talked about how to use the entirety of an officer's career in looking at promotions, looking at things that went well, things that didn't go so well, factoring in all those in a very systematic way as we make promotion decisions. We've changed the preference we give to New York City residents as part of the reform package that we did with the council. So now New York City residents will be further favored in the recruitment process to become police officers. And we're addressing so many of the root cause issues, looking at what has historically been called a poverty to prison pipeline and how we can undo that and address the root causes. All of these things are work we're working on right now as part of that original reform plan. But we want to do more. And in the conversations uh, with community members, with elected officials, particularly city council members, a lot of other ideas came up that we want to keep addressing. And I particularly want to give thanks to council member Adrian Adams of Queens, who is the chair of the Council Public Safety Committee. We had a number of very detailed conversations as part of the reform process. And we talked about the fact that although there's been real progress in ensuring diversity in the leadership of the NYPD, there's more work to be done. And we talked about the ways that we could make sure that happens systematically not just on the basis of individual promotions, but on a, a whole systematic level throughout the NYPD. And we talked in particular about other approaches that have worked in this country. And one of them we borrow from professional football, from the NFL, the Rooney Rule, the idea of ensuring that for every major position that there is a guarantee that people of color will be interviewed and given maximum opportunity. That approach in professional sports has proven to be effective. There's always more to do, but it's really helped. We want to bring that approach here to the NYPD. And it's something that, you know, it could be done in a lot of different ways going forward beyond the NYPD, but we're gonna start with the NYPD because it's so important to show the communities of this city that everyone is represented in the leadership ranks of the NYPD. So I want you to hear from some of the council members who've been involved in this reform process. And I want you to know that the work we all did together has led to the decision to issue an executive order that will address the hiring process at the NYPD and ensure that diverse applicants, candidates get opportunity. So this will be a major reform and a systemic reform. And it came out of these conversations with the city council and particularly with the chair of the Public Safety Committee, my pleasure to introduce Chair Adrian Adams. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Thank you. I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, for having me on this morning to speak about this important executive order that I hope will bring some changes to the upper ranks of the NYPD. And I think it's uh, highly appropriate that this executive order is issued on the last day of Women's History Month, which is extremely important. You know, we know that a lack of objectivity creates favoritism, nep nepotism, and discrimination. And like many aspects of our world, representation and diversity are important because you wanna see yourself, your experiences, and your community reflected, whether it's in government, in our civic life, or in policing, having decision makers at the table who understand your background and have walked in your shoes make a tremendous difference. Your policing report, Mr. Mayor, shows that recruits of color have increased from 47% in 2013 to 60% in 2020 and from 17% to 24% in women. So that does show that the police department has made an effort and with some success 
to reach into underrepresented communities when it comes to recruiting and hiring. And while I do give credit where credit is due, there are still significant disparities when it comes to the upper ranks and leadership where important decisions are made, decisions that impact not just the police force, but residents, businesses, and everyone who interacts with the police. Today's executive order to ensure a diverse candidate pool when considering top NYPD promotions is crucial to achieving the goal of diversity at the top. When we talk about equity, as part of that conversation and this executive order will provide that opportunity. And while the NYPD is mandated to conduct a meaningful interview of at least one qualified applicant who comes from a diverse background, I certainly hope it won't just be one candidate who's considered, but several candidates of color and women who are ready for the job. I'm confident that this important change combined with other reforms to the promotions process will have an impact on diversity in the upper ranks of our police force. And I hope it will make the police department more transparent, more fair, and overall more representative of our great and diverse city of New York. Like I've said in the past, and you've just said, Mr. Mayor, this is the floor. We're not at the ceiling yet. This is just the beginning. This is not the end. And I'm truly committed to doing this work. So thank you again, Mr. Mayor, for issuing this executive order and for taking this crucial step towards meaningful, meaningful, transparent, and fair police reform in New York City. Thank you so much, council member. And thank you. I really appreciate our conversations and I appreciate the way it helped bring out new approaches, new ideas. Thank you for your leadership. And as we said many times when you and I talked, uh, police reform is something that continues. And we're going to be doing a lot more in the course of the months ahead. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn to uh, your predecessor, uh, who was public safety chair earlier in our administration and, and with whom I spoke many times as well, and someone who is passionate about neighborhood policing, about ensuring that there's a deep bond between police and community. She's been a leader in the reform efforts uh, from the very beginning of this administration. My pleasure to introduce Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Good morning to you. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing well. Blessed Wednesday. Thank you so much for having me today. You are very welcome. Thank you. As the first woman and person of color to chair the Committee on Public Safety in the New York City Council, I have always talked about the priority of diversity, both in the recruitment of new members of the service and at the executive level. Together, we have worked with the NYPD, fraternal organizations, and many stakeholders on collective efforts to ensure that the NYPD is reflective of our diverse and talented city. Today's announcement is a bold step in the right direction to begin the necessary reforms to the discretionary promotions process to focus on a diverse and qualified executive team leading the police department that looks like New York City. This effort will improve fairness and equity in our system and ensure that all candidates considered for discretionary promotions is inclusive and transparent. At the highest levels of our department, we have an important and a unique opportunity in this moment in history to lead by example and demonstrate our commitment to attracting the very best leaders to keep all New Yorkers safe. Unfortunately, there has been a long history of many candidates of color and women not holding executive level positions. But we have started to see changes, and I want to acknowledge those changes by the recent promotions of a diverse team of leadership, including this week's promotion of Chief Rodney Harrison as the new chief of department, the highest ranking uniformed member of the service. Also want to acknowledge the recent promotion of Chief Juanita Holmes as our Chief of Patrol. And I also want to acknowledge the past leadership and the dedicated service of our former Chief of Patrol, Fausto Fichado. 
When a police department is trusted by its community, the job works exactly as it should. We build that trust by ensuring the NYPD hires qualified women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups to these leadership positions that will ultimately reflect the diversity of the New Yorkers that they are sworn to serve and protect. The ranks of African American, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian American and female officers has increased over the years, particularly at the entry level of the department. The department has in fact become less white overall, particularly in the lower ranks. We continue to work towards a diverse department at the executive level. This is a step in the right direction from our administration towards increasing transparency and fairness for NYPD executive promotion. We are seeing women and people of color shatter glass ceilings and break down historic barriers in so many fields in our city and in this country. Now we have an opportunity to do the same for the NYPD. So I am thankful, Mr. Mayor, for today's executive order, which affirms our commitment and our dedication to this important issue. And I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your leadership in striking a delicate but necessary balance. I want to thank the NYPD for working with us, my colleagues in the city council, our chair, Adrian Adams. I want to recognize the Black, Latino, and Asian caucus the Women's Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, advocacy groups, and all of our community leaders that have always talked about diversity. We have more work to do in the days and the weeks and months ahead, but today is an important step forward. The best and brightest leaders in the NYPD are right here. Let's make sure we identify them and give them the opportunities to lead our city with compassion with conviction and with commitment. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you very, very much, Council Member, and thank you for your passionate expression of the fact that there's just tremendous talent waiting to be tapped, and that's exactly what we will do through this action. Thank you very much. And one more member of the Council I want to hear from who has, for years, long before he was an elected official, was an activist uh, fighting for the community's voice to be heard, and he has played a key role also in efforts at police reform, uh, always remembering his roots, which I appreciate very, very much. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have said since day one, I said today, as you are a, at the end of your turn, the city of New York has never had a progressive mayor like you. And I know that even at a moment when we cannot accomplish all the goal, I know the history of New York City will always have you as someone that advanced the opportunity for community of colors, working class and middle class to have a better chance to excel. To reduce crimes in New York City, it takes more than your enforcement. The same thing will happen to improve safety and to continue establishing better relationship between the police and the community. It takes a lot of work. As a person of color, I have had my fair number of interaction with the NYPD. In the 1988, I was arrested on 181st and San Nicolas Avenue after taking a political science class 101 and exercising my constitutional right when I was told to move from being there, giving a flyer. And I said, why should I move? And I was told by the, by the police officer at that time, because I said so. And I told the officer, but I have my right. And the answer was, you don't have any right as Dominicans. Mm -hmm. One thing I can say is that many of the interactions I have had with the police officer who have been very different if they were people of color over the Dominican descent like myself. However, my interaction with the police officers is not only the negative side. I have a brother of mine who was a police officer. I have many friends. I've been working close with the inspector and the commissioner too. I congratulate Mayor de Blasio because I know since day one, 
when you took office, you inherit an office that lack diversity in many city agency and especially within the NYPD. I want to get one thing clear. Today's executive order should not be seen as taking away from qualified people who are Irish, Italian, Jewish, or white. I believe that what we are doing today is balancing the playing field for people of color so that they may have the same opportunity to be promoted to high brass positions. We need a police department that reflects the diversity of its people, all 8.7 million of them. We are a city comprised of 32% white, 27% Afro-American, 29% Latino, 14% Asian. Our offices must also be a reflection of New Yorkers living in New York City. This initiative by itself will not be the final solution. This is an initiative that together with many others that also you have taken on, will bring the changes necessary to improve our police department, to improve the relationship between the police and the community, to also and to improve the public safety, safety in our street. I also hope that by working with you, Mr. Mayor, we can bring additional diversity to many other city agencies. The protests we saw during the summer highlighted the need and urgency for police reform and an increase in police adversity. The council has been working close with you to pass significant police reforms. Today, a security order takes us one step further. We still have much more to do. I look forward to continue working to work alongside you, Major de Blasio, Speaker Johnson, Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams, and my colleague and advocate to ensure we make New York City the city that had the largest first city in the country. Gracias al alcalde por su liderazgo, por la oportunidad que nos da hoy en esta orden ejecutiva, donde se crean mejores condiciones para que el departamento de la policía le dé más oportunidades a oficiales de colores a ser promovidos y tener mayores oportunidades de, te, de tener liderazgo en el departamento y que lo mismo siga ocurriendo en todas las agencias de la ciudad. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, council member. Thank you also for telling the story of what you experienced years ago when you were leading those students in protest and the, the notion that anyone would be told they don't have rights because of who they are, where they come from, is anathema to everything we believe in in New York City. So I think it was a powerful vignette to remind us it is so important to the communities of this city uh, to see members of their own communities represented in leadership. And uh, one of the things we heard throughout the reform process, the very, very intensive series of public hearings and meetings, stakeholder meetings, almost 100 different gatherings during the reform process, was the consistent request that we see more and more diversity in the NYPD and more and more diversity in the NYPD leadership. So thank you for being a part of that. And this is what we're going to do today with this executive order, ensure systemically uh, that we take a major step towards diversity in promotions for senior leaders of the NYPD. And let's sign the executive order. And this will take effect immediately. I want to emphasize that. This will be affecting all promotion actions by the NYPD starting immediately. All right. With that, we're going to go to what we talk about every single day, our indicators and our fight against the coronavirus. So first, number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 237 patients. Confirmed positivity level, 61.48%. Hospitalization rate, 3.83 per 100,000. Number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report, 3,461 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19. Today's report on a seven-day rolling average, 5.93%. Now I want to say a few words in Spanish, and I'm going to go back to the police reform we just discussed. Una parte vital de nuestra recuperación para todos es fortalecer los vínculos 
entre los, la policía y la comunidad. Hoy firme una nueva reforma para hacer más diverso el Departamento de Policía. Nuestras comunidades están más seguras cuando nuestro departamento, departamento de Policía se parece a nuestra ciudad. With that, we turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Ted Long and by senior advisor, Dr. Jay Varma. First question today goes to Andrea Grimes from WCBS. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for taking my, uh, my call. Uh, my first question is regarding the Asian hate crimes. A number of the suspects have proven to be homeless men, and it seems like these attacks are getting increasingly more violent. The NYPD was taken out of the homeless outreach business. Who is in charge of monitoring the homeless population, helping them, and, and getting help for them, and specifically the, the, the people who are more violent? Andrea, look, thank you for the question. We, uh, in every way as a city, have to work together to stop these attacks. Um, we are seeing them, uh, different people, different places, they're all unacceptable. And again, the crucial need is for, in every case, whether someone regards it as a small act or a major act, to report it. Go to nyc.gov slash stop Asian hate, report anything you see so the NYPD can act. Um, Andrea, to your question, I want to first affirm, the lead agency for everything regarding homeless individuals is Department of Homeless Services. But Department of Homeless Services works closely with the health department, with health and hospitals, uh, certainly with NYPD as well. NYPD still, of course, has a role to play. But the lead agency is Department of Homeless Services. Uh, we are going to have all the agencies work together to address these issues. And that means everything from deploying uh, street outreach workers or mental health professionals, or in other cases, of course, how we move NYPD officers around, precision policing. Uh, not only officers you see uh, in uniform, but also undercover officers, decoy officers. This is a tactic the NYPD is using now to try and find these perpetrators. Uh, this is crucial to the equation. Finding, it's a very few people, but we need to find each and every one of them and stop this. Go ahead, Andrew. Thank you. And my second question is regarding taxes. The combination of new federal taxes proposed by the president and the proposed $7 billion in New York state taxes would make New York the highest tax state in the nation. How worried are you that this will force people out of the city, affect the city tax base, and should New York lawmakers seek a lower tax increase given what the feds are doing? Well, Andrea, first of all, um, I am not worried. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, since the 1960s, the amount that the wealthy pay in taxes has just steadily gone down, and that was amplified by the huge giveaway to the wealthy and corporations that Donald Trump engineered in 2018. So let's be really clear. The wealthy are not even close to paying their fair share in taxes, and we need them to. There is so much to be done in this city, in this nation going forward. And a lot of folks who are wealthy got wealthy because of laws that favored them, whether tax laws or other laws that helped them gain all their wealth. So no, we have a lot to fix here. President Biden is absolutely trying to move us in the right direction. I commend him. But Andrea is a long different distance between him proposing something and what actually happens in the end. The same, of course, in Albany, whether the exact proposals show up like this or some other form, we don't know yet. But uh, the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. And especially if that's done on a national level, I think that does help to uh, create evenness among the different states. In the end, what we've seen for years and years is changes in the tax rate do not dictate behavior. Uh, this is really well documented. Uh, wealthy folks are going to be wealthy either way. And there are so many reasons that so many of them want to be here in New York City. In fact, more and more people in New York City have become wealthy in recent years because there's so much economic opportunity here. And just the life of the city that so many of them want to be a part of. So I think we're going to be strong 
uh, regardless of what happens with the tax decisions. But if it's a matter of fairness and justice, the wealthy should pay their fair share. The next is Sydney Pereira from Gothamist. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor. I want to ask about uh, vaccine equity um, among Black and Latino New Yorkers. Um, it, the gaps, the racial gaps in vaccinations have um, improved slightly for uh, Latino and Black residents in the city, um, but still not by that much. It's like three or four percent. And I'm wondering, um, in Philadelphia, there was an implementation of walk-in appointments at the FEMA vaccine sites, and early results showed that that improved the diversity of who was getting vaccinated. Um, I know there's some walk-in options for older New Yorkers at city sites, but do you think more vaccine sites should move towards walk-in options to address racial equity issues with the vaccination rollout? Um, and if so, which ones? And obviously there's state sites, so I'm wondering if you've talked to uh, the state, uh, you know, the governor and state health officials about this issue to, to speed up closing these racial gaps. Thank you for the question, Sydney. It's something we talk about all the time, we care about deeply. There is definitely progress. There's progress because we put the overwhelming majority of the vaccination sites in the communities that were hit hardest by COVID and where people of color and immigrant New Yorkers could best access vaccination and with community-based organizations, with houses of worship. Uh, that's made a huge difference. We're gonna keep deepening that strategy as we get more and more supply. So that really to me is the number one thing. We're also seeing hesitancy start to reduce. We all know, Sydney, there was a big difference in hesitancy levels between white New Yorkers and New Yorkers of color. We're seeing that now start that gap to close. We're seeing less and less hesitancy in communities of color, especially as people experience the vaccine, members of their family, neighbors, et cetera, have a good experience. So I'm very hopeful on the overall. Um, we are experimenting now a pilot program with the walk-up uh, vaccinations focusing on the oldest New Yorkers. But I think your point is well taken. If we see this approach starting to work, it's something we'd be open to doing more in a targeted manner. Uh, but we're, we have to pilot it first, because there are always concerns about making sure it works effectively, that it doesn't end up with long lines. You don't want that for a lot of reasons. So yes, we're going to pilot it and see if it could be helpful. And yes, we're going to see if it might contribute uh, to achieving more equity as well. Go ahead, Sydney. Great, thank you. Um, my, my second question is about um, shootings in New York City, and I really want to ask about this from a public health perspective. Um, shooting incidents and shooting victims have so far risen again in 2021 after you know, the, the very high rise we saw last year. Um, and I know you've invested, re made recent announcements about cure violence initiatives uh, to start this summer. I'm wondering with the federal stimulus or you know any other just change in the budget situation or how how um, if is there any way to help those violence interrupters start their work sooner to get ahead of the rise in shootings often seen in the warmer months and um, I know there are multiple council members on the call or or there was I don't know if they've dropped off or not maybe they've dropped off but I'm um, just having talked about um, police reform at the top I'm wondering if if there are still council members on the call, what non-police solutions would they want the, you know, the mayor to implement to address shootings in their districts? I think the council members have left. Yeah, they have. So let me just speak to the okay. point, Sydney. Um, we want to maximize the work of the cure violence movement and the crisis management system. Um, since I came into office before the recent actions we took, uh, starting with State of the City, uh, we had already tripled the funding. Uh, for cure violence. It was a really nascent uh, reality when I took office. We've made it an important part of the strategy and really dedicated serious resources, and we will continue to. To actually build out the work, it is painstaking work. What folks in cure violence and crisis management do is outstanding work, but it takes very careful design and training, and it's not something you can just flick a switch. It does take lead time. So that's where our focus now is really having those operations be as strong as possible uh, for June. And a lot of cooperation with the uh, cure violence and crisis management leadership to get that done. But I agree with your, I think your question's raising the point, are we looking at any and all community-based solutions to violence and everything that we can do 
uh, particularly ahead of the summer? The answer is yes. And uh, I think unlike last summer where we had so we did have that perfect storm. We had so much that was not working in our society. Jobs gone, businesses closed, schools closed, houses of worship closed. Everything now is obviously coming back. It's going in a much better direction now. We're experiencing with each month more and more recovery, more and more activity, sort of things re-solidifying. I think that's going to make all the difference. But we are going to invest heavily in young people this summer. This is something that the council has really focused on as well. We're bringing back uh, summer youth employment, uh, the full strength where it was before. We're, you know, we're going to be looking for every opportunity uh, to maximize the other kinds of investments that also help us achieve safety. The next is Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, good morning, Mayor de Blasio. How are you? Good, Katie. How you doing? Well, you know, not bad. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you have any information or, or any specifics, again, on this May 3rd reopening. I've heard from multiple city employees who say what you're saying on TV is not what they're seeing. The infrastructure improvements, the HVAC improvements. Do you have a cost estimate? I know that we had that when schools were kind of retrofitted to allow for schools, but do you know how much the city has spent so far on these infrastructure improvements to allow for cleaning and particularly airflow in once employees return? Uh, Katie, it's a great question. I will make sure that our team gets you. I don't have it at my fingertips, but gets you the latest. Now, it's to be fair, uh, we've learned so much about how to do this. And I think our office settings are places where we, it's a very straightforward approach. You know, how many people you want in one place, everyone keeping on their masks, making sure the ventilation is good, making sure there's regular cleaning. We have a pretty good game plan. Uh, and we're still talking another uh, five weeks or so until folks start to come back. But we'll get you a sense of the costs involved and how it's progressing. Uh, but I feel very confident we can do this safely. Go ahead, Katie. And uh, following up on that, I know you said you've learned so much from the schools reopening. So will there be, like we've seen in schools, a situation room? Is there a policy on closures if someone in an office, if there's more than one positive case? Will there be weekly testing? Just more information on that. Yeah, and we will be saying a lot more as it gets closer. I think the, the central point, a great question, is we, of course, want a clear mechanism and a well-coordinated mechanism for ensuring if there's anything that needs to be addressed. Uh, that it's done uh, promptly. Uh, the Situation Room was created for a very different reality uh, with uh, 1,600 schools and, you know, very, very challenging logistics. Again, our city office buildings, that's a, a much more finite uh, universe. Uh, so we'll talk about how we're going to handle those individual situations, but I think it's a very good point you're raising, and we will go through it in one of the press conferences laying out the details of how we're approaching it as it gets closer. The next is James Ford from PIX11. And good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Good morning, James. How you been? Uh, not bad, thank you. Not bad. And I appreciate you taking my call. Uh, this may be something of a follow-up to the previous question. Look, Pfizer is now saying that it has 100% efficacy for vaccines for children aged 12 to 15. And there are trials going on for children six months to 12 years old. With this new information, how might that impact the uh, full reopening of schools, maybe even without uh, the three feet social distancing or with it? But if you could say what preparations you all are making, noting that there is this new information and more expected to come out regarding vaccination for children. I think this news from Pfizer falls under the category of it's all good. I mean, this is really great to hear. It just gives us more tools and uh, more ability to keep moving forward. I'm going to turn to Dr. Varma, who's been very deeply involved in all of our efforts around schools from the beginning. But let me just say it this way. You know, I think what this means is we're just going to see more and more people uh, vaccinated as uh, we go forward, particularly looking to September. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, you know, uh, getting through the whole approval process and then vaccination starting to happen is its own reality. But every time we hear that vaccinations work with another age group or that new vaccines are coming, anything that gives us more capacity uh, helps us move forward. 
Um, but we already know, James, our schools are the safest places to be in New York City right now. And that was true before there was widespread vaccination. So it only will get better with more and more vaccination. And we are already planning uh, for September to bring all our kids back uh, for everyone who's ready to come back. Uh, but this will, you know, as this progresses, it just makes it better. Dr. Varma. Great. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, just to echo what the, the mayor has said about the results, uh, you know, these are ultimately verified when they're presented to the FDA. This is just extraordinary news. I mean, to be quite frank, I, I literally almost dropped my phone when I saw how uh, how impressive the data was that Pfizer released. It's, it's amazing and incredibly important news. And it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, the, the long-term quest is us for to get to a level where a large enough percentage of the population is protected um, so that we can go back to living the way we normally can. And so anytime we can expand the group of people that's eligible, that is just absolutely great news for all of us. Um, number two, as you know, it's going to have a really big and important impact on our schools. It may be challenging, of course, for this current school year. Again, remember that, uh, you know, first of all, the vaccine data has to be presented to the FDA. They have to authorize it. Then people have to be willing to accept it. And then, of course, there is that time lag. It takes about three weeks between your first and second dose, and then at least another two weeks for you to, for you to take effect. So we are looking, I think, probably more at the summer for us to really accrue the benefits um, kind of as a whole society, and then, of course, as it relates to our schools. Uh, but, but absolutely, this is really tremendous news, and, and it may have a really important impact on what happens with our school protocols in the fall. Um, I think we're just going to have to wait and see, um, you know, as we get all the final data and as we pull it all together, what that exactly means. Thank you very much. Go ahead, James. Congratulations for passing the 4 million threshold for uh, dosages. Uh, but can you put this in terms of people? I mean, how many New Yorkers uh, are fully vaccinated? How much further do you have to go? And also knowing what you do about supply, how soon might we realistically see every New Yorker who is eligible and wants to get vaccinated actually get the vaccine? Okay, so James, first of all, um, we are going to start talking more and more about how we are moving toward our goal of 5 million fully vaccinated New Yorkers by June. Uh, to date, uh, of course, one of the challenges has been the difference between the folks who take the two dose approach and those who take the one dose with Johnson & Johnson. But we're going to uh, increasingly capture that information and provide it so you can track our progress. Um, the um, the overall reality is we're confident, absolutely confident about hitting that 5 million mark uh, in June. Now, where is the natural endpoint potentially? And I'll get Dr. Varma the way in here too. I think we have seen that first of all, supply wise, uh, we unquestionably, we proved it last week, we can do half a million doses a week. We can probably do substantially more than that. Uh, so, so long as we have supply, we'll just keep expanding. We're hearing good things about the April supply levels. We're hearing that there could be really extraordinary supply in May. So that says to me, going into May, going into June, it's going to be easier and easier for people to get a shot. Where do we get to a point where there's more shots than people want them? I, I don't know yet. I think my hope is that hesitancy keeps decreasing, and as supply increases, more and more people get the shot, more and more people know people got the shot, it went well, they think, hey, maybe it's time for me to do it. You know, hesitancy goes down, down, down. There's always another person to give a shot to. My sense is that will continue certainly through the summer. But let's hear Dr. Varma's assessment. Yeah, I actually, I concur exactly with the mayor. I mean, I think what we know from vaccine programs uh, that go back many decades here in the United States and, and the experience overseas is that, um, you know, getting good acceptance of a vaccine is not an immediate process. Uh, we, we, you know, obviously we've all been through this incredibly traumatic time that none of us have ever experienced in our life. So we are seeing really good uptake right now because everybody understands this is the way to protect yourself. This is the way for us to all get back out of this. But we also know that people have appropriate questions. Um, they are skeptical for any of a number of reasons. 
And we know this with all vaccines, that it does take time to get to that point. So I think as the mayor has noted, 5 million, I think is a very good, acceptable uh, target for us to think about a time when enough of the population is protected, that our health system is safe, that the number of people who are, are at risk of dying has declined dramatically, um, and we will start to see lower levels of disease. So I think that's a really good sort of intermediate endpoint. And then the longer term endpoint is to work on hesitancy over time. And it's going to take all of us to do that. You know, we have to be vaccine ambassadors ourselves because there's going to be friends and family members that have questions. And we need to show them, well, we got vaccinated. This is why. What are your concerns? And us try to address them on an individual basis and continue to do that at a population level. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The next is Odalis Molina from Telemundo. Oh, hello. I'm sorry. Odalis, um, can you yes, hear us? Hi, Mayor. How are you doing? Yes. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> How are you doing? Thank you so much for... Uh, I'm doing great, Mayor. I'm doing great. Um, I have a question for you, and this is uh, regarding... Um, this is regarding the vaccine. About the vaccination, how would the program or protocol will work for those 16 years and older to get vaccinated starting in April? Could you go over that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll turn to Dr. Varma and Dr. Long. Uh, so you're right, uh, next uh, week, in fact, uh, folks 16 and up will qualify. And, uh, you know, I think the, even though it's going to be a new group of people, it doesn't change the basics of the process. So Dr. Varma, Dr. Long, you want to speak to that? Sure. I appreciate the question. It's really important for everybody to know and feel comfortable uh, with how to make appointments. So the same way that today, uh, if you are eligible, you can go to our website or to call our number uh, fax for NYC. Um, those opportunities will be made available um, the same way for people 16 and above um, when they're eligible for the vaccine next week. One thing I'll note is that the Pfizer vaccine is the one that is available for people 16 and above. So when you call or go on our website, it's clearly demarcated which sites have that vaccine in case you're 16 or 17 years old, so you can know which site you should be going to. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Odalis. Yes, there are talks about the fourth wave uh, due to the increase of the uh, new numbers of COVID cases in the nation, plus a different variant reported. What is the plan for New York City looking ahead? Can you talk a little bit about that or share more information? Yeah, Odalis, look, um, I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Varma. The, um, we take the situation very seriously. And again, what we decided long ago is the only way to make decisions is by you know, being led by the data and the science. We are watching these numbers every day, every hour to discern what kind of moves we need to make. Um, overall, look, thank God we have seen the situation in the hospitals improve markedly. We've seen fewer deaths, but we're still really concerned about the number of cases. We're still really concerned about the impact of the variants. So we adjust constantly. Where I would keep saying there is a concern is some of the decisions that the state is making. I think some of them are premature. Uh, certainly the fitness classes was an example of that. I'm concerned uh, the decision that they made about uh, indoor athletics for colleges. Again, we think athletics should be focused on outdoor activities for the foreseeable future while we see how the variants play out. So I think there's some decisions that are taking us a little too quickly uh, into areas that it's, it's just premature. That would be my concern. But I think if we, if we stay careful and cautious, we can navigate this because the pace of vaccination is so intense. That's the good news. And we think it's going to jump up a lot in April as more supply comes. Dr. Varma, you want to add? Yeah, thank you very much. I, you know, to echo what the mayor has said, you know, we are still in, uh, you know, coming down off this second wave of ours. And unfortunately, we are not um, seeing the declines that we really want to see. So we remain very concerned. Um, I think our, our healthcare system has proven to be incredibly resilient. Um, but our, what our real concern is people getting sick um, and people dying. And we need to do everything we possibly can to prevent that. Vaccines are the most powerful tool to achieve that, um, but they take time. 
Uh, it takes time to receive the vaccines. It takes time for your body's immune system to be fully protected. So in that interim period, we have to double down on all of the measures that we've been taking for this past year. Uh, the reason it's called pandemic fatigue is because it is hard. Um, it's hard for all of us emotionally, physically to, to sustain this. But we need people to keep wearing masks, getting tested, maintaining distance, washing their hands, and staying away from others if they happen to have symptoms. There is a very real possibility that, um, you know, we can be completely out of this, um, you know, within another six to eight weeks of very aggressive vaccination. Um, but we do run a risk of, of having a resurgence if uh, we relax some of those measures of safety that we know work so well. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The next is Sean from The Daily News. Morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, how You're you doing? Exec I'm good, thanks. How about yourself? Good. So your executive order today reminded me that when you made Dermot Shea police commissioner, you came under some criticism um, for missing a potential opportunity to make a person of color the city's top cop. I mean, I think Council Member Rodriguez, who was on the call just now, gave an Im impromptu press conference to that effect. So just looking back at the, at the year that's passed since then and your executive order today, do you have any regrets about making Dermot Shea the top cop instead of a person of color? No, uh, Sean, look, we're talking about something much bigger than just who is the commissioner. Um, we're talking about putting together a leadership team and continually evolving. So, look, I think what we've seen has been an incredibly tough period. I give Commissioner Shea a lot of credit for helping this city through this period and also building up a leadership team. Um, the folks who are in leadership now uh, Chief Harrison, Chief Holmes, but so many others who represent this whole city. Uh, and he's been doing that systematically right down to the precinct level. And I think it's something that uh, should be looked at to recognize how much he has focused on diversifying leadership within. Uh, so no, I think, I think this has been the right approach, just keep continually building it. And I think it needs to be systemic, which is why we have the executive order. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so thanks for that. Um, I also wanted to go back to some of your comments yesterday, encouraging New Yorkers to intervene if they see a hate crime unfolding. And if you could bear with me, when I, because I have a kind of analogy in mind, um, basically trying to get at what example are police officers themselves setting here. And it's a slightly different scenario, but when it comes to mask enforcement, my understanding is that's something police officers have basically stopped doing. There'll be times anecdotally, one is on the subway, you'll see someone not wearing a mask. Police officers will see the same thing and, and they tend not to say anything about that. So given that that's the case in that seemingly relatively low risk scenario, what kind of example are police officers themselves setting for New Yorkers who you're asking to intervene in potentially very dangerous scenarios? I, I respect the question, but I don't see the analogy. Um, what we are doing with masks overwhelmingly there have been times when, of course, there has been enforcement necessary, but overwhelmingly what the approach is is a positive approach. It is an educational approach. It is reminding people. It's giving people free masks. A lot of that's been done by civilians. Some of that has been done by police officers. Uh, that continues. We're going to continue to focus on the subways and making sure uh, that as people come back, there's mask distribution. But I think when you see, I mean, I, I really was reacting, Sean, to that horrendous video that we all saw yesterday. I understand if someone, you know, here's a, an older woman being kicked on the ground. Someone needs to do something. And again, whether it is screaming out, whether it's calling 911, whether it's, you know, trying to get the assailant to move away, whatever it is. Uh, it's a choice people have to make, and I always want people to be smart and careful, but that was just uh, horrifying to watch, you know, someone standing right there and turning away rather than trying some form of intervention. Uh, that I think everyone can find some way to contribute in a situation like that. And again, I hope we see this trend end once and for all. But I do think every New Yorker can stand up to hatred in a lot of different ways, and I want to remind people of that the right way is to do it. And you get a lot more information. Again, go to nyc.gov slash stop Asian hate for the information on how to do that the right way and to report anything you see because we need those reports to find the perpetrators of these acts. 
We have time for two more for today. The next is Abu from Bangla Patrika. Hello, Mayor. How are you? Hey, Abu. How you been? Good. Thank you so much for uh, you know asking, uh, Mayor. Um, I have a question, which is about the first. There is the about the vaccine that the people who are taking the vaccine, two vaccines they already took, but they are still infected. And, um, you know, people have questioned whether which one is good, which one is bad. Is there any definition of the Johnson, Moderna, and, um, you know, the other vaccine have any kind of difference? I'll turn to Dr. Varma with this statement, Abu. I, I don't think there is such thing as a perfect scenario here. The notion of the vaccines is to greatly reduce uh, the risk of being infected, and it's particularly the risk of the worst outcomes. That's where the vaccines have been outstanding and consistent. But they are not perfect. Um, and I think that needs to be understood. Uh, and from what I've seen, they, they all perform the most important function, which is guarding against serious medical issues and particularly protecting people against death. Uh, so Dr. Varma, take it from there. Yeah, so as, as the mayor has, has discussed, there are basically two main ways that we consider a vaccine to be effective. Number one, does it protect you from getting severely ill, being hospitalized and dying? And the second measure is, does it protect you from transmitting infection to other people? On the first question, we know the answer and we know it for all three vaccines. They are extremely effective at protecting you from being hospitalized or dying. And we know this from the studies that have been done, and we know this from the real world experience here in the United States and in many other countries overseas. So our recommendation remains the same. The best vaccine is the one that you can get right now. So whatever vaccine option you're given, take it. It's not about a brand, it's about the outcome. The second question is one that public health people are still continuing to study, but we're seeing really good news. So the second question is, does it protect you from not potentially infecting other people? And we've seen a study that came out from uh, CDC this week that is really tremendous news. It looks at the first two vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and shows that they are incredibly effective at stopping people uh, from getting the infection even without symptoms and tra transmitting it to other people. So I think we're going to probably eventually see very similar data uh, for J&J &J and can be quite confident again that the best vaccine to get is the one that's available to you right now. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Abu. The marijuana, which uh, you uh, have a statement and you told, told is talked about in the morning. Uh, do you have any statistics that what would be the negative impact on the society and the public health of marijuana? Well, I'll, I'll see if uh, Dr. Varma or Dr. Long want to comment, but I'll, I'll say this. I think the important point here was to recognize uh, we've had widespread marijuana usage for decades. Um, it has been uh, only counterproductive to have it be illegal while also being simultaneously widespread. This is a case to me of use the legalization process to address the injustices, the mistakes in the criminal justice system, the mistakes in our law, the disparate negative impact. Um, try to create some positive in terms of economic empowerment for communities that have suffered and revenue that can be used for good purposes rather than just an underground economy. But also address legitimate health and safety issues out in the open. Uh, it is an opportunity to do that. Uh, so I just think it's a much more sensible approach. I, look, as a parent, uh, you know, I certainly took seriously that there are health and safety issues here, and I think we need to. But I actually think we'll have more ability to do that with this being something out in the open with rules and laws, including age levels at which people are allowed to uh, buy marijuana, that um, are going to allow for a better approach, a better conversation. Dr. Varma or Dr. Long, you want to add? Uh, sure, I can start, and I would just echo exactly what you've just said, which is that, you know, we know that, that any type of, of product has a risk of potentially being abused, but we also know that any type of, of product um, can be managed if you put in the right resources, and those resources don't involve uh, criminal justice. Uh, they involve 
you know, informed, supportive care to help people with their problems. So um, I know myself, again, as a parent, um, I think that my, you know, I tell my children, you know, there are things that adults should do and there are things that kids should do. And, and my recommendation is that they stay away from kind of mind altering substances when they're younger and they wait until they're older. And for adults, I think we are still learning, you know, are there long term uh, complications or not? But what we do know is that a lot of adults do use these products safely. They lead highly functional lives. They lead to no severe health outcomes. And we need to have a society that doesn't criminalize um, that type of action and does provide support for people who do end up having problems with it. Thank you, Dr. Long. One and I would just add on to that. Yeah, I mean, as a primary care doctor myself, one of the biggest concerns always with drugs is that they can be, potentially be misused. Having the right regulations in place to ensure safe and appropriate use of um, things like marijuana will only help to save lives. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Last question for today is Yehudit from Borough Park 24 News. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I am doing very well, Yehudit. I hope you are having a season Pesach. Oh, I am. Thank you so much for the beautiful wishes. And everyone in our house started to say that because of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so <laughs> So speaking of Aziz and Pesach, I don't want to sound so much like a Jewish mother, which I am, but um, I know you support the legalization of marijuana, but opponents of the marijuana's bill, bill's passage say that it could lead to the distribution and marketing of the drug to minors and revenue of, from the drug being used for criminal purposes such as guns, guns, gangs, and cartels and the distribution of the drug to states where it's not legal. Other concerns are that the legalization of marijuana would increase traffic deaths, experimentation with harder drugs, addiction to marijuana, and that children and other New Yorkers would have to live under a perpetual haze of secondhand smoke. So I'm just wondering, I just before I ask the question, I want to say to Dr. Varma, I think that we all know as parents that, you know, you can tell children, you know, don't do what we do, but we all know that whatever we do for good or for bad, children are going to imitate. So. I, I really firmly believe that. So I was wondering, Mayor de Blasio, if you fear any co negative consequences at all from the legalization of marijuana in New York. It's a great question, Yehuda, and, I, and it's, you always ask very uh, earnest questions, and I appreciate it. And I'm a parent, you're a parent, Dr. Varma's a parent. We're all uh, working through these issues all the time. I think um, I used the analogy the other day to another really problematic part of our history when I said don't ask, don't tell. I think that kind of approach is always the one that fails. So I think the notion of, okay, we, we, for years and years we had laws officially saying it was illegal and yet marijuana use was widespread. Uh, all the criminal activity you were discussing uh, was actually happening in part because it was illegal. Uh, we looked carefully, when I put out the uh, study I believe it was December 2018, although the years are all mushing together now, but when we put out that study, one of the things that I said to my team was spend the time talking to all the jurisdictions that had legalized, particularly where they had bigger cities, talk to their police departments, talk to their health departments. Uh, we got our public safety team, our health team involved. We all processed what we saw, and what we saw was there was not an increase in criminal activity. Um, we're talking about places in California, Seattle, Denver, you know, major cities. Um, but thank God, at least some of the worst things that came with the previous laws were being addressed in the sense of getting rid of the negative impact on people's lives from harsh sentences, expunging those sentences, um, offering some economic opportunity to communities that didn't have enough again, some revenue that was going to the public sector for health and safety rather than just flowing illicitly. So I do understand the concern, truly. But I think, Yehuda, it's like every other challenge in society. Bring it out in the open and address it and educate people and take the steps to help people be their best selves and be safe. That's a hell of a lot better than, you know, having it be a shadow economy and, and think that that's going to work for us. So that, that would be my analysis. Go ahead, Yehuda. Uh, okay. Well, I have a follow-up question to that, but I think I'm just going to move on to something else. So, um, so 
it's such a great news about increased vaccination and eligibility and vaccinating for a million New Yorkers. And doctors Chocksky, Katz, and Easterling have addressed in press conferences and conference calls many of the misinformation that I still hear, um, such as that the vaccine affects fertility, was rushed, or somehow dangerous. And of course, we all on this call um, value news as a way to spread truthful information and fight misinformation. I was wondering if you would consider launching more vaccine information to fight hesitancy on mediums that people who are hesitant are perhaps more likely to believe, such as WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, and other forms of social media, and maybe also have a greater variety of religious leaders to publicly take the vaccine. I think those are great ideas. Um, we have had some religious leaders take the vaccine, but I agree with you, we need to do more. In fact, one of the things, your timing is impeccable, Yehuda, because one of the things you're going to see starting this week and the next few weeks is more and more of the vaccine centers being in a diverse group of houses of worship and in their community facilities. So synagogues, mosques, temples, all sorts of different places. But I think you're right about having more religious leaders uh, join us and expressing their confidence in the vaccine. I think the more places that we have the vaccine distributed, the better. And I agree with you, more and more emphasis on social media. And we're going to be making a lot of emphasis on community and ethnic media as well. I think, I think this is a more is more kind of equation, Yehuda, that we, we need to just keep patiently explaining, answering questions, showing how much faith there is, including from trusted people in each community. But I'll tell you the good news is we are seeing the tide turning. I mean, all of the public polling is showing it, but us, our experience on the ground. Um, more and more people coming forward, and there's less and less hesitancy. And I'll finally say this, when I, when I talk to people, I go to the vaccine centers and I talk to people, and many people, when I say, did you feel some hesitancy, were you worried? A lot of people start by saying, at first I was. I wanted to see how it went for a while. I wanted to see you know, if some other people that I knew got it. But that momentum now is shifting. More and more people getting vaccinated, more and more people feeling comfortable. So that is definitely the good news. And I'll come finish with this. I want to just reflect on um, the action we took today, the reform through the executive order. Again, this work of bringing police and community together, this is work that we will be doing for years and years. It's something we always need to keep perfecting. There's lots more reform to be done, but the good news is we are doing it. We are doing it as a city together. And when I think about today's executive order, I think about an NYPD that just gets better and better in the future, more and more diverse. And I'm thinking particularly about the precinct commanders, because they play such a crucial role. We now are involving communities in the selection of their precinct commanders. Uh, that's been a reform that has been very, very powerfully received. Folks see that as the beginning of a bigger change. These decisions being made more together. Now with this executive order, it's going to help us ensure that those who lead precincts who play such a crucial role in keeping communities safe, that more and more will reflect those communities. And that's going to give people more faith. Folks deserve to see the opportunity for members of their own community to have a chance to lead. And the more that happens, the more respect and faith people have, the more they feel respected. So look, to me, over these last seven years, I've seen so much change. And I know and I give credit to NYPD. It's an organization capable of tremendous change and improvement, and it keeps doing that work. And today is another big step on that road. And I look forward to the day, and I believe it is coming, where every young person in New York City can see themselves reflected in NYPD, that they can feel that the NYPD is there to protect them, and they can feel a connection that sometimes they haven't in the past that there's a mutual respect, the sense the officer is there for them, but they also can feel a connection to that officer. That may sound a little utopian, but I believe it is where we can go. And that changes everything on the ground. And that's what we aspire to. Thank you, everybody.